Hi all and welcome to this video covering the electric fields topic from electromagnetism at advanced higher level. So what we have in this topic is going to be covering everything from the original charges of positive and negative which we talked about all the way back in S1 right through to advanced higher level. So we're going to start with the basics having a look at two isolated point charges. So this diagram here shows two charges positive on the left, negative on the right, and their surrounding electrical fields, as shown by the electric field lines. Now, these field lines are shown to be moving radially in and out of those point charges. The reason for that is that as an isolated point charge, there is no other charges around them, so they are not experiencing any distortions, so they give a radial field shape like this. The direction of the arrows are given by an understanding of using a point charge as a test and we use a positive charge as our test charge so if we had a positive charge and we placed it near to our positive charge we're showing on the diagram here those would repel each other and the direction of that repulsion would mean that our test charge would be moving away from our positive charge so the arrows move out from positive charges Likewise, if we go to the negative one and have a look at that, if we put a positive test charge next to our negative charge, they would experience attraction, and the arrows show that by showing a movement in towards our negative charge. However, when we have two or more point charges near to each other, well, those fields do interact with each other. So we don't get those radial fields anymore, and we get the two following diagrams. The one on the left, which looks very similar to a bar magnet's magnetic field, um, shows the interaction between a positive and a negative charge. And again, we see there that the charges are close enough to each other so the fields interact. And we see there that the field lines have arrows moving from positive to negative. The separation of these field lines, how close they are together, that denotes the strength of the electric field at those points. And that's something we're going to come back to in a later topic. Looking at the diagram on the right, we can see there that those field lines um, through repulsion of two similar charges shows that there is no charge directly between them. Sorry, not no charge, no field directly between those. Therefore, we're seeing here this process of repulsion. OK. So that is our end of our nice quick recap looking back from our earlier revision. Now what we're going to be having a look at is an understanding of Coulomb's law. OK, so in Coulomb's law, that is taking it to our advanced higher level. And it is really, really similar to what we were talking about for gravitational fields. And we're going to find as we move through this topic that there's a lot of overlap between what we had to look at in unit one for gravitational force and in this case, electrostatic forces between two point charges. So in this diagram here, what we've got is we've got charges Q1 and Q2. In this case, Q1 is positive, Q2 is negative, but that won't always be the case. They are separated from their centres, bearing in mind that when we're talking about a point charge, we are literally talking about a one-dimensional point. So centre is really more of a, a, a topic that will come up later on here. But yeah, so we're talking here from the separation of these two point charges being equal to a radius R. OK, so the scientist that came up with this was Charles Augustin de Coulomb, hence the reason we call this Coulomb's law. And he discovered experimentally that the electrostatic force between two point charges was directly proportional to the magnitude of each charge. So the larger the charge, the stronger the force between them. And it was also inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating those two charges. So if you doubled the distance, you quartered the electrostatic force between them. Now, you'll recognise those being pretty much the exact same rules we had for gravitational fields as well. So it's the exact same thing we had, except in this case, we're replacing masses with electrostatic charge and we're doing the distance separating them is still going to be an R squared relationship. OK, so moving forward from that, we can put that into a calculation. So experimentally, we can show for Coulomb's law the following formula here. So Discussing what we just talked about there, that the charge Q1 times Q2 divided by the radius squared is proportional to the force experienced. Now, as I said, that is very similar to what we had to look at in gravitational force, where it was M1, M2 over R squared was the gravitational force proportional relationship. And as we had in gravitational force, where we had to have it equal to a constant value, 
um, in the forms of the gravitational constant, we have to do a very similar process here for electrostatic force. It's not written as simply as it was for the value of big G. In the case of this, our constant of proportionality is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon or epsilon naught. Okay? And in the case of this, what we've got there is that term epsilon naught simply just refers to another constant. And it's referred to as the permeativity of free space. Okay, and that has a value of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, and that's something we will explain right at the end of unit 3, and we'll come back to why that is the case. But for now, all we need to know is that the permittivity of free space has a value of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. So, that brings us to the end of the theory for this first topic section. What we're going to be moving on to now is having a look at a worked example for this to understand how we actually apply this formula in a question context. So having a look here at example number one, we've got three identical charges positioned as shown. So points A, B and C. They're all separated at different distances, but they each have a charge of plus eight nanocoulombs. So what the question is asking us to do in this case is to calculate the force exerted on charge A by the other two charges B and C and the resultant force therefore on charge A as an overall. So to start us off in this question, the first thing we need to do is take each of charges B and C in isolation in regards to charge A, and then we'll do a vector calculation at the end to get that overall resultant value. So to start us off with this, we're going to be using the equation we've just discussed where F is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, times q1 q2 over r squared and in this case we're going to start with a and b interacting to start off with so what you're going to go for for this one is you're going to end up with the value of 9 times 10 to the 9 times 8 times 10 to the minus 9 times 8 times 10 to the minus 9 remembering obviously to convert from nano coulombs to coulombs and dividing by the separation between a and b which is having a look at 0 0.6 meters remembering to square that giving us 1.6 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons as our force value. Now the direction of that force is along the line BA giving repulsion. So remember these are like charges so they will be repelling each other. Okay, And then we repeat that process again for A and C. So we see in that case we've got the same calculation except it is now 0 0.8 squared on the bottom because we're at a different distance. So we get 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons for the force between C and A. The direction again is along the line CA and again it's given repulsion. So that would be giving us the values for question 1 here, the forces exerted by, sorry, forces exerted on charge A by charges B and C. As I said, we then need to do our resultant force calculation by doing a vector diagram for that. And that is what's shown in this section just here. So as we can see there, if we add those in the form of a vector triangle, we get one side being 1.6 times 10 to the minus 6 from the force of B on A. And another side of the triangle is 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus 6, which is the force of C on A. And we get the resultant on the right hand side of this diagram here, which we calculate by doing Pythagoras and trigonometry, as we've done right back in National 5 for any of our vector calculations. So we see there that we work out a resultant force magnitude of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. And by working out that angle there from the start to the end point, we get an angle of 29 degrees as the angle within that triangle. But what we need to be really careful of here is that that right angle triangle is not showing a vector that is going straight up and down there, north, if this was on a diagram on a page. What we've got here is at some angle, and we need to figure out where we're taking that angle from. We need to have our starting point in order to be able to give direction in this case. And to do that, all we have to do is pick a line that is represented on our diagram. So we're going to jump back up to our diagram there. We see there that we don't have north, south, east, west, we don't have top of page or anything described on the diagram. So what we do is we refer to this new direction, this resultant vector, based upon our directions that are already on there. Now we've got two of them that we can work with, the line AB or the line AC. They give us a starting point that we can work from. And in the case of the diagram we've done for our vector here, we have worked off the line AB. 
So that's how we discuss this in our answer. So if we're setting our answer up here, we'll be writing it in the form of the resultant force on A is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons at an angle of 29 degrees anti-clockwise from the line BA. And that brings us to the end of this video covering the electric fields topic from electromagnetism in advanced higher physics. Thanks for having a listen.